hitting start because I need to let Nick Lund in. So we are live right now. Um, so just be mindful. Uh, for folks who are just tuning in, uh, we're still getting organized. The program doesn't start for another eight minutes or so. So thanks for bearing with us. If you uh, want to grab some lunch or um, we'll be with you in just eight, eight minutes or so. We're just getting organized here. Thanks for being with us. Hey, Anya. Hey, how's it Nick. going? Good, how are you? Hey. So again, uh, we're live, um, so I could make you guys panelists. Um, so hello to folks who are joining early. Again, this program doesn't start until uh, noon, so we got about eight minutes left. So that's your chance to grab some lunch, use the restroom before we get started. So thanks for bearing with us. Um, but yeah, we're all set on the tech side of things. Um, Nick uh, and Anya Fetcher, I will make you both co-hosts. Great. Um, oops. I think I'm only allowed to have one co-host. I think I'm only allowed to have one co-host because um, when I just tried to make Nick and Anya Fetcher um, both co-hosts, it, it kicked Nick off and uh, demoted him to a attendee. So, and Nick, you're muted right now. I think the email I'm using is not my NLUND email. It's media at Maine Audubon. Is yeah, that so that was the problem and initially. That's um, okay. why you couldn't log on to start. If you can only have one, do you want to just make Nick the co-host? And Nick, would you be able to share my slides? Or Sure. Um, I can reshare you on the link to them. Actually, well, if you have, I emailed mine to you already. Right. It might be easier for you to put those in after yours because then I would have to okay. get yours out of the email and then build into my presentation. Sure. I will see if I know how to merge slides. Otherwise, we'll reconvene. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess also I just thought I don't know if it matters if you are the – do you only need to be the host because of the sharing slides or are there other – yeah, I, I think um, I think it's I think it's just that the only other way was that if something were to happen for the tech, then I think the co-host can t can take up the mantle. Okay. Yeah. So right now I'm the host, and Anya Fetcher, you're the co-host. Um, so either I would need to share my my screen for the slides, or or Anya, you would have to do that. So. Anya, I also think that you don't have to merge them if you want to just, since they do have a break in between, Yeah, that. Mm. Cool. cool. Yeah, I was thinking about that too. All right, I'll figure something out. Um, so hello to the folks who are not on the panel. Um, we are not getting started for another five minutes. Uh, we're just getting situated here. So thanks for bearing with us as your chance to grab some lunch um, before we get started. So thanks for your patience. And type in the chat where you're coming from. I want to know where people are coming from. I'm in my cold basement in Cumberland. Mm -hmm. Yes, please uh, type in the chat uh, where you're uh, zooming in from today. That'd be good to know. I love David's bookshelves. There's no way you read all that stuff, but it's, it's a nice look for the room. 
Um, I don't know who Bruce is, and I don't know why he's a panelist. North Fort. Hey, Bill in Portland. Hey, panel. All right. Ashram Working Lands Working Group. Uh oh, we can't say anything wrong anymore. Todd Bruce has disappeared. Yeah, yeah. I, I hid Bruce. Uh, well, Bruce isn't a speaker, so uh, I don't know how he was promoted to a panelist. But, but hi, Bruce. You're welcome to, to stick on and join us. Please do. <laughs> yeah, of course. CCI. Why am I blanking on what CCI is, Andrea? From CCI. Oh, Conservation Codbird Initiative. Right. I was trying to think it was a, as an, a, I thought it was like Shabig Island, Norway, Maine. Right. Of course, I was trying to think, I, I was thinking it was a, it was a place. Gotcha. So for folks who are just tuning in, uh, we're still getting situated. Uh, program starts in uh, about three minutes. So thanks for your patience and bearing with us. We'll get started in just a few minutes. I'll plan on probably holding it a couple minutes after the hour for, uh, I found that people generally join right on time. Um, so we'll give it a minute after for people to join on. I'll just say, Nick, before we get started, um, we'll want David and both Anya's to turn on their videos. Um, yeah. So we have all of our panelists live. <laughs> there it is. The most Anya's per capita of any per capita of any presentation, I think, of this on all of Zoom. Yep. Still getting used to it. <laughs> Same here. I was telling the others that my parents listened in to yesterday's climate council, main climate council meeting, and they were like texting me, another Anya? <laughs> Kathleen Layden from DMR is also on the Climate Council Steering Committee, and I swear every question that has been asked of her in the last year has struck panic into my heart. Like, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> and, oh, phew. There's another Kathleen who knows. Hey, Brian from Bar Harbor. Wish I was up there right now. Other folks, while we wait, so I see 12 on the dot, we're going to give it another couple of minutes. Usually this is when uh, the, the bulk of people join us. Welcome if you're just joining us to the Climate Halftime Show. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes. Uh, wait for people to filter on. So uh, in the chat, if you want to type where you're coming in from, it would be great to know. We've got a good range of folks, Bar Harbor, Norway, others, Sopo, Westbrook. Freeport, Wells, look at this, Machias, Augusta, Vinylhaven, they're all coming in. Augusta again, Auburn, Lewiston, Auburn, where the, f oh, from Los Angeles, California, you're evacuated. Giselle, thank you for joining, I hope you're safe. Jonesport, Camden, MDI, Mapleton, Freeport, Ellsworth, Pompano Beach, Florida, Sarasota, Florida, strong Florida contingent, Tom Allen in Portland, Newcastle, Northport, look at this. I love it. Nicole typed in from Brunswick into the question piece. Feel free to type in the chat. We'll cover some of these tech things in a moment. 
Damaris Gata. Hey, Bruce. Right hey, on. You're really making this sound like a halftime show. Yeah. Um, the team you know, is running out of the gates. <laughs> Just so people are joining, we did talk to Beyonce. She was going to perform, but uh, she had to cancel at the last minute. So this halftime show, unfortunately, you're just just us um, this time. I can dance later, maybe if you want. But um, uh, that's please, all please got. don't sing. <laughs> you, yeah, nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. Um, hey, Tom and Gardner, Falmouth in the house, my hometown. 202 on the clock. I'm going to give it another minute or two um, for people to come on in, finish their lunch, and do what they need to do. So you've got a good showing already. Welcome to everyone. Thanks for taking your Thursday. So we've got all the panelists. Everyone can hear each other okay, right? Great. Yeah, and we're doing good. 12.02. David, where are you again? Can't remember. I'm in Brunswick. 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 House. Gotcha. Although a native of Old Town. Wonderful. Ah, moved down south, huh? Yeah. yeah. Moved down to the big city. Yeah. All right. All right, I see numbers still ticking up, so I'm going to give it another one minute before we go. I'm the only one invested in these virtual backgrounds, huh? I, I need to, I, sitting over next to me on the floor of this basement are two, one big can of primer and one big can of paint that I bought in April and have not done anything to my walls with. One of these days, um, I'll uh, have something nice to look at, but until then, let me get this, much nicer sunset. Maybe you should uh, paint a bookshelf on your wall. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> I need uh, uh, the Roadrunner from the Roadrunner cartoons to paint those realistic backgrounds behind me. <laughs> Get a train tunnel or something. Numbers are still going up, so I want to hold on. Hey, everybody for who's, uh, who's on and waiting. We are just getting started here, letting people filter on. Welcome to the Climate Halftime Show. Uh, again, if you want to type in where you're zooming in from, that would be cool into the chat. Um, and I see 1204, so that means time to get going. Hello, everyone, and welcome to what we in Maine's climate action community are calling the halftime show analysis and commentary on the September meetings of the Maine Climate Council. Uh, we're calling it the halftime show because the Climate Council has done a lot of work already listening to Mainers and has a lot of work left to do to develop the final plan. Uh, we want to catch you up on what has happened so far and get you ready for the push to the end. Um, our goal today is to get you up to speed on what was said during the September 9th and September 16th the virtual public Maine Climate Council meetings and provide some insight from our community on the climate action plan still in development and due on December 1st. First, on behalf of the organizations in our community, I wanted to express my excitement and gratitude uh, that we get to have meetings like this. Um, thanks to Governor Janet Mills, Maine is one of the trailblazers of the climate change planning, and this year's climate action plan will likely serve as a model for other states working to develop action. We want to thank the governor and her staff at the Office of Policy Innovation and the Future, GOPIF, and all of the members of the Maine Climate Council and its working groups for their hard work so far. And honestly, what better time to be doing this than now? Despite all the challenges facing this state and the country right now, Maine's government has recognized the obvious. We can't delay responding to climate change. Um, there is smoke in the air from the fires on the West Coast, for goodness sake. Uh, we know from polls that Mainers want to take action on climate change despite the challenges from the pandemic. And we're so pleased that the Maine Climate Council has continued to meet regularly, though virtually, and is still on track to produce a climate action plan by December. These are exciting times. Uh, the groundwork's being laid and the policies potentially implemented will benefit Maine, not just in the sense of improving our environment and our futures, but also putting Maine back at the center of innovation, posi positioning us to meet the economic challenges as well. Uh, 
But we'll only see those benefits if we can produce a bold and equitable plan. And we're here today to discuss uh, what we think about be whether we're on track. So uh, before I get too far ahead of myself, um, I'm Nick Lund, the Outreach and Network Manager at Maine Audubon. And I'm joined by four distinguished panelists representing just a small sample of the organizations in Maine working to support a strong and equitable climate action plan. I wanna introduce them now. Um, with me on the Zoom is David Costello. He is the Climate and Clean Energy Director at the Natural Resources Council of Maine, NRCM. David worked for the state of Maryland, overseeing the development and implementation of Maryland's Climate Action Plan between 2008 and 2015. So he knows about how these policies and, and procedures work. Um, also joined by Kathleen Meal, Kathleen Meal, excuse me, the Director of Policy and Partnerships at Maine Conservation Voters. Kathleen co-chaired the Buildings Working Group of the Maine Climate Council and serves on the Council's Steering Committee. Welcome, Kathleen. I'm also joined by Anya Wright, the Youth Representative on the Maine Climate Council and a founding member of Maine Youth for Climate Justice. Hi, Anya. And also by another Anya, Anya Fetcher, the State Director for Environment Maine. Welcome. Okay, so in a moment, we're gonna start with a recap of the September meetings. Um, but first, I wanted to take a moment to do a little bit of housekeeping here um, and remind you, uh, and then turn it over to Anya Fetcher to remind us how we got here in the council. So some housekeeping things. We have one hour to get through a whole lot of stuff. So we're gonna to try to keep things relatively short. Um, we're gonna save public questions for the very end. Um, the way public questions are going to work is um, you see here we have two functions on this Zoom webinar. We have the chat function, uh, which is that single uh, bubble uh, speech bubble thing down below, and also the Q&A double speech bubble. Um, uh, in the chat, please type where you're coming from, other little things. If you have a question for the panelists, please type that in the Q&A box. That uh, makes it much more easier for us to organize. So put your questions there. We're going to save them for the end. Um, secondly, this is being recorded thanks to Todd at NRCM, and so this will be available online afterwards if you miss anything uh, or want to share it, that would be great too. Um, that's all. So, all right, let's get started. We're going to start now with a brief orientation of where we are in the process of the Maine Climate Council, and for that I'm going to turn it over to Anya Fetcher from Environment Maine. Great. Thanks so much, Nick, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, as Nick said, I'm also really excited that we get to have these kinds of conversations. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just share my screen uh, with everyone to get this going. I'll give you just a brief overview for those of you especially who uh, are less familiar with the Maine Clim Climate Council, how they came to be and what they're supposed to be doing. Um, so in, uh, on June 26th of 2019, the governor and the legislature created the Maine Climate Council. Uh, it's an assembly of scientists, industry leaders, bipartisan local and state officials, and engaged citizens. So that was about a year and a quarter ago. Uh, the Climate Council is charged with developing strategies to both reduce Maine's greenhouse gas emissions and to ensure Maine's people, economy, and communities are more resilient to the impacts of climate change. You can see here they've, uh, they have these guiding principles uh, that they are referring back to as they continue their work. More specifically, the council is tasked with developing a four-year plan to put Maine on a trajectory to reduce emissions by 45% by the year 2030 and by at least 80% by the year 2050. By executive order of Governor Mills, the state must also achieve carbon neutrality by the year 2045. The way that the Maine Climate Council is set up is there is the Climate Council itself, but they're also supported by a number of uh, subcommittees and working groups. Uh, so the working groups have make up, are made up by a total of about 250 members, um, and they were created to inform the Maine Climate Council and recommend strategies for the Climate Action Plan. 
So each working group spent months developing its climate mitigation and adaptation strategies, which were presented to the council this past June. The working groups are buildings, infrastructure and housing, coastal and marine, community resilience, planning, public health and emergency management, that one's a mouthful, energy, transportation, and natural and working lands. In addition to those six working groups, there is also a scientific and technical subcommittee, which provides the latest information on direct and indirect effects of climate change, along with factors contributing to those effects in a state to the Maine Climate Council's working groups. Uh, and this helps, has helped inform their research and consideration of mitigation, adaptation, and resilience strategies. The 369 page report that they just released uh, it goes into great detail, of course, on the way climate change will affect Maine, and it is available on the Maine Climate Council website. Uh, we'll also share that in the chat with you um, in a bit later. And then last, just a brief timeline um, of how this is all working and where we are now. So technically, the first Climate Council meeting was actually last September, just about a year ago, uh, launched, launched their first climate or quarterly meeting. And since then, working groups have been meeting to talk about and propose solutions. Uh, and then in January, the Climate Council, Council met again um, to really start this process and start digging in. In February, the Scientific and Technical Subcommittee uh, released their draft, uh, their first draft phase one of um, the climate change and its effect on Maine report. And then this past summer, as I said, on, uh, in June, the Maine Climate Council working groups, um, they presented their draft strategies to the Maine Climate Council. Following that and throughout the rest of the summer, the Maine Climate Council considered these draft strategies in addition to receiving the cost of doing nothing and cost benefit analysis reports from external analysis, uh, Eastern Research Group and Synapse. And they also gathered public input in on the draft stat strategies in the form of public surveys, which I believe that many of you filled out, which has been incredibly important. We had, uh, I believe, 4,400 or so responses. And this fall, that's where we are now, in case you lost track of time, uh, we are in the September. Uh, so the Maine Climate Council is currently refining and selecting final strategies and uh, preparing for the, uh, the state climate action plan. So originally there were going to be two meetings now because we're doing things over Zoom. Uh, there are five meetings planned. We just wrapped up number two yesterday. There will be two more in October and one more in November. And then in December of this year, uh, the four year state climate action plan is due to the governor and legislature and they will consider and decide any legislative and rulemaking actions to enact in law. And then just going forward, the, that is not the end of the line when they deliver the uh, plan as after it's submitted the Climate Council will continue to meet quarterly working groups will meet at least twice a year to monitor the progress. The main Department of Environmental Protection will report on greenhouse gas emissions every other year and the climate action plan updates every four years. So this plan is intended to shift and change as we learn more uh, about the science and uh, as technology advances. In addition, ideally, uh, our climate community feels that we really hope that things end up moving even faster and the policies are more aggressive than these original goals. So that's just a bit about the Maine Climate Council and what they're at, and I'll turn it back over to Nick. Great, thank you, Anya, for that overview. That was fantastic. Um, I'm gonna uh, touch on a little bit more uh, the meetings that the Climate Council just had in terms of an overview. So we are coming at you um, a, a day and a week after the Climate Council held two meetings, one on the September 9th and one on September 16th. Um, and I just want to cover what was said a little bit more there before we dive into the discussion. Um, but actually, we want to uh, take a pause for a poll question really quickly. So Todd, if you could load that up. We want to ask um, for the folks who are on this call, um, did you attend or uh, zoom in rather to um, those meetings, the September 9th and September 16th meetings? Uh, it would be great to 
um, get a sense of where the audience is coming from and, and um, how they're doing. So if you could take a moment, please, and I see that popped up. Thanks, Todd, that would be great. So while I give you time there, that's a, that's a quick one. Um, so about half and half, um, about 60, 40 weren't in tennis. That's good to know uh, in the great mix of folks. Thank you for uh, filling that out. So um, Anya, if you could share the first of my slides, please. Um, so the goal of these two meetings in September was for the Climate Council to discuss the draft of its proposed climate strategy framework. Um, there we go. So this is going to um, set the stage for the more detailed policy discussions to come over the coming months. Um, the council divided their climate strategy framework into two parts um, that you can see here. Um, part one was discussed at the September 9th meeting. Uh, part two was discussed yesterday at the 16th. Uh, and you see, so part one, we're thinking about strategies to reduce Maine's climate, uh, carbon emissions. And strategy two, or, or part two rather, were strategies to prepare for the impacts of climate change. Um, under each part of the framework, uh, there were three strategies. Uh, the proposed areas under the first part, as you can see, and I'm just sort of reading off the, off the slide, but I do wanna make sure that we um, are on the same page about what they're talking about. Uh, when we're coming to reducing Maine's carbon emissions, uh, number one, we're talking about bringing the future of transportation to Maine. Number two, modernizing Maine's buildings. Number three, driving innovation to reduce carbon emissions in Maine's energy and industrial sectors. Again, this was what was discussed at September 9th. The three strategies under the second part, uh, strategies to prepare for the impacts are number one, build healthy and resilient communities. Number two, invest in climate ready infrastructure. And number three, protect Maine's environments and natural resource economies and promote climate change solutions. These were what were discussed at yesterday's meetings. Um, folded into the draft proposed climate strategy framework were two important reports uh, that have been touched on a little bit already. Um, number one were the results of public surveys that Anya mentioned. Um, these were uh, brought out to the public in July and August. Um, pushed out by a number of groups. Um, we got a great response out of that. Over 4,400 Mainers from more than 150 towns filled out these surveys, um, which focused on the particular recommendations of each working group. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about what those surveys revealed in a moment. Um, secondly, there was a cost benefit analysis conducted by the Eastern Research Group and Synapse Energy Economics. Uh, which analyzed the vulnerability of the state of Maine to future impacts from climate change. Uh, it analyzed the cost of doing nothing, or as someone mentioned, um, the cost of doing nothing different uh, in response to climate change in the state. Um, there was also an emissions analysis uh, of draft greenhouse gas reductions from various strategies proposed by the working groups, uh, and an economic analysis of the draft emissions and adaption, adaptation related strategies proposed by the working groups. Uh, we'll be talking also about that more in a moment. Um, and we're going to turn now, we're right on time, I think, to um, some discussion about what happened at the two meetings and um, those uh, reports. So um, all my panelists off mute, please. We are getting started. Here we go. So we're going to start uh, with some discussion uh, through these panelists. Uh, this is going to be a really interesting sort of back and forth, we're hoping. Um, and we're going to start, I think, with these public surveys. Um, so there was a big push um, for the public to complete surveys about their climate concerns uh, over the summer. And as we said, more than 4,400 Mainers were completed and the, the findings were folded into these policy discussions. Um, on your right, I'm wondering if I could start with you um, to share your thoughts on these surveys and, um, and what the responses showed. And actually, before you say that, I do want to say that thanks to Anya Fetcher for putting a link to a summary of these public surveys in the chat there. Um, so Anya. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, and thanks to Anya F for putting that link in the chat. Definitely worth taking a look at. Um, but yeah, as Nick mentioned, there were uh, 4,400 or 4,400 um, responses to these surveys that were put out for public comment on um, the working group recommendations. 
um, and they came from 150 main towns, which represents about 74% of all main zip codes, which is um, impressive given the fact that we're in a global pandemic and that originally um, public uh, input was going to be gathered through a lot of uh, a lot of in-person meetings that then went virtual. So um, definitely impressive how many people were able to respond. Um, and I think uh, as a climate council member, uh, these public comment, uh, this public comment is really important to me to make sure that we're really reflecting what people in Maine are concerned about and what priorities we should be looking at. Um, and I would add to that, uh, though the surveys are closed, the climate council is still receiving public comment until September 24th, which I know we'll talk a little bit more at the end. Thanks. Great. Um, does anyone want, anyone want to talk a little bit about sort of how those surveys uh, were set up and maybe what they revealed uh, once the final um, summary came out? Yeah, I can add a little bit there. Um, thanks, thanks, Nick, for the question and Anya for setting that up and for all of you for, for being with us today. Uh, the responses to those surveys were overwhelmingly positive. Uh, the way they were set up was by each working group. And there was basically a list of the strategies that the working group had, uh, had proposed and an opportunity to indicate whether those felt like a great fit, a good fit, or not such a good fit for, uh, for each individual in their community. And what we saw is that really the more people know about the particular strategies, the better they feel about them. Uh, the buildings working group, for example, led off with a recommendation about weatherizing existing homes, and that was incredibly popular. More than 86% of, of respondents said, this is a great fit for my community. And, and I think that really reflects how much work we've done as a state to, to get that weatherization and energy efficiency ball rolling already. Uh, and it, it gives us a lot to be optimistic about that as we uh, spread the word and the access to more of those climate action strategies, we'll see really good responses to those as well. Uh, I also think it's worth noting that those, those positive responses came at a time when we're all very aware of the other challenges that our state faces, right? The, the cr climate crisis is, is not the only overwhelming crisis that we're working through, right? We have a, a public health crisis, an economic crisis, a racial justice crisis, and people are still saying, yeah, and it's important to act on climate right now. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think too, that point is underlined, you know, one of the survey results asked folks, um, which aspects of the community are you most concerned will be harmed by climate change? And the top four answers were number one, public health, number two, wetlands and coastlines, number three, wildlife, and number four, Maine's economy. Um, all of which were, you know, are, are extremely important in people's minds and represent sort of a broad, uh, I think, swath of concerns from, um, you know, personal health to the economy to environmental concerns. So um, I, I think um, that was interesting. Uh, any other Nick, yeah, Nick, hi, good, af good afternoon to everyone. I would just add as well as the public surveys beyond this, the public polling has actually been very positive for climate action. Overwhelming numbers of Mainers support doing a lot more to address, you know, the causes and consequences of climate change. So I'd just add that as well. That's great to know. Um, David, I'm going to continue with you um, for uh, about the cost benefit analysis. Um, what were your thoughts about that report and um, was there anything missing? Well, a couple of things, Nick, just to give a shout out as well to the science and technical subcommittee. They've done a superb job with their, their assessment of the of climate impacts and effects in Maine. Tremendous job. ERG's uh, work, recent work, the cost of doing nothing that you just mentioned, for instance, the key takeaway there is that not doing any more would, would likely lead to at least a 15% decline in economic output and a loss of 20, 000, over 20,000 jobs in Maine by 2050. Uh, getting to, to the, so obviously we need to do more and we want to do more and that's what we're talking about today. The cost benefit analysis itself, and this is something that will continue as the climate plan itself continues the, the, and the climate actions are undertaken. The, um, 
it did a good job, and Kathleen's going to start off and, and talk about some of these more specifically in a minute, but they did a great job of identifying the most cost-effective programs, particularly from a cost savings perspective. However, they didn't do enough or, or much, notably, for instance, I mean, regarding some key strategies. And what I would note is there was nothing done from a cost benefit perspective on the funding mechanisms that are going to be needed to drive progress. So that's something that obviously the Climate Council and the state will need to focus on more going forward. And also there wasn't much said about potential jobs. I mean, clearly as we enact and make the kinds of investments we'll be making in the coming years to, to re really build a stronger, healthier, more resilient and prosperous Maine, we're gonna be investing a lot of money. And this money is gonna turn into thousands and thousands of jobs, whether they're adaptation jobs or jobs related to energy efficiency, uh, economic uh, energy, uh, renewable energy deployment and development, building out a doubling the size of our electric grid, for instance, to accommodate the beneficial electrification. Uh, and, and just so people know, that's a, we're spending, sending over $5 billion out of state, $5 billion for energy uh, to address energy costs in Maine. Much of that can be brought back to Maine and will be brought back to Maine in the coming years. So again, Tremendous economic output. And when we talk about jobs, high quality jobs, if we do it right. Um, so I think again, as regarding cost benefit analysis going forward, we'll look more at the attributes per, you know, particularly the specific key actions that the state does, does enact when it refines its plan and but provides better detail. And of course the state's already said that they need to do more to prioritize and sequence the actions. And as they do that, uh, obviously we'll be looking for implementation targets that'll e be easier to, to provide analysis on as well as benchmarks and maybe even biennial benchmarks to, to go along with the state budget process. So I, those are the kinds of things I think we'll be looking at as the cost benefit analysis continues. And let me just stop there, Nick. That's a great answer. Thanks, David. And, and, you know, just to sort of underline that point, there's a lot of optimism right now around this in, in a world where there's not much optimism in any other uh, facet, um, you know, that a strong plan here can help us not out, of, not just out of environmental hole, but really position us uh, economically in a great place. Um, and so uh, I, I think the cost benefit analysis revealed that and additional, you know, thinking there will, uh, will emphasize that. Um, you know, to Kathleen, um, are there strategies, uh, which of the strategies here that you see, you know, maybe overall uh, have the greatest greenhouse gas reduction potential, uh, according to some of the analysis I've done so far? Yeah, that's a really great question. And the, the analysis that came out of ERG and Synapse was super helpful in, in thinking about how these strategies compare to each other. Um, there's a slide that I think will help us Fabulous, thank you, Anya. Um, so what you see here is over on the left, a list of the, the strategies ranked by their greenhouse gas reduction or sequestration potential. And then you see how the ones at the very top are the most cost effective. Uh, important to note that this is not a competition. We're not looking for the one strategy that will solve all of our climate problems. Uh, we're going to need to enact a whole host of strategies to, to reduce our emissions, to sequester carbon, and to, to address the climate impacts. But it is really helpful to sort of sort them, uh, to sort the possibilities to see what's a good place to start. I think this work will be really helpful as the council thinks about sequencing strategies. And you can see that a number of the strategies that revolve around buildings are not just cost effective, they're cost saving. Uh, anybody who has, has drawn on efficiency main programs to uh, weatherize your home or to put in a heat pump, uh, you know this. You know that when you invest in, in tightening up uh, and, and weatherizing homes, you get more comfortable you get an energy savings immediately. That's a great way for us to think about uh, messaging these potential strategies for the public, right? To say, this is something that is a no-brainer. There are no regrets to investing in, in these strategies. 
as we move down that that scale and get it slightly less cost effective but still really cost effective uh, we think about evs electric vehicles uh, have a have a slightly higher price point at this point but we know from auto manufacturers that that is the way the industry is moving and uh, the commissioner of the department of transportation bruce van note described this sort of future vision where there is a, a used EV and a hybrid pickup in every driveway in the state. And, and when we think about that, uh, we think about how much those cars are going to save us money. No more oil changes, no more maintenance. Uh, you got to rotate your tires, but that's about it. So there is a, a future where this really is saving Mainers money and time and energy and and also meeting our climate goals at the same time. So this kind of analysis is is really helpful. Great. Um, thank you so much. Any other thoughts um, on that on the energy saving piece. If not, I can move on to sort of a, a, a broader overarching question, uh, which is, you know, as we think of these overall and we think about the world of policies that that are sort of on the table here that can help us get to our climate goals um, can we have a sort of a broader discussion about what some of the impacts of some of these policies and consideration would be like for mainers um, anya maybe i could start with you sure thanks nick yeah so i think it's worth noting that um the statute that we have now in Maine is one of the boldest in the country and there's a real opportunity to, for Maine to be a leader. Um, and so I think that's one big opportunity here. Um, also, of course, the sense of urgency that my generation and future generations have. Um, there is definitely a level of needing to get things done, but also there's a lot of social and economic um, and obviously environmental uh, opportunities with this next climate plan. Um, and one of those being uh, encouraging more climate justice and climate focused education within our public schools. Um, as we sit now, folks within my coalition of young people are struggling with finding access to climate education within their schools. It's not a part of the general curriculum at the moment. So that's a real opportunity to create um, a really strong, resilient next generation of folks who are very educated about the issues that we're facing right now. Um, and maybe I'll pass it along to um, to someone else to talk about another policy. <laughs> sure, let me let me jump in on you. Thanks. Um, one thing I'd like to highlight in terms is just the challenges as well, um, and and the the key strategies that are likely to address those challenges best, and in doing so, really drive the benefits that we've all talked about in terms of the economic benefits, the the environmental benefits. These are the strategies that, quite frankly, we believe, or at least many of us believe, will, uh, you know, deliver the greatest results. And in the two challenging areas, transportation, the, the the greenhouse gas reduction challenge. You've got the the transportation sector and the building sector. That's 80 80 percent of Maine's emissions. So what we do there is some of the things that Kathleen's already started to talk about are important. The other the elephant in the room. The other challenge is is financing. And of course, it's it's tough, but we've got to address we've got to address these. So the strategies that we think, or at least certainly I believe, will will do the best in delivering the broadest, most significant benefits. You know, again, helping to build you know Maine to build that stronger, healthier, more resilient, and prosperous future for all Mainers, and certainly addressing Mainers who are uh, living in underserved communities, for instance, and and low and moderate income households. On the transportation side, I think it's critical. Uh, that Maine sign on to the Transportation Climate Initiative. It's a regional uh, cap and invest program that's been discussed since 2009. It's similar to those who are familiar with the Reggie program, where what you try to do is you try to use, you put a cap on the regional emissions tied in this instance to motor fuels, motor vehicle fuels, and you tighten that cap over time. And in doing so, you get the polluters to pay uh, to pay to emit they buy allowances. That money, it could be up to $150 million a year for Maine, would then go into to trans, what we call transportation solutions, as Kathleen started to talk about, EV deployment. We think 
electrifying transportation is going to be the best way to reduce those 54% of emissions in, in Maine and help us reach our, our goal. And of course, also what it'll do on the transportation side, it'll fund solutions. And again, you can design it in a way that much of that money goes to rural communities or other communities that are disproportionately impacted. So it'll help to build out public transportation, for instance, expand public transportation services in Maine much more equitably and just expand, expand them as well. Help with better land use planning, compact, smarter growth, for instance, and development, allowing more walkable, livable communities. Um, and as Kathleen said earlier, uh, the, the, the expansion of the, the EV deployment. The other thing I would mention on the financing side, because that's a real tough nut to crack, it's gonna be important for the state to have a detailed action plan, regardless of whether or not the money is there. We need to meet what science requires in our, our implementation targets. But at the same time, we can be honest and realistic about the challenges and financing is a big, big challenge, particularly given the economic downturn and COVID. The COVID crisis. So what, what we could do here now, some of the money I mentioned will be raised by TCI. The other, the other thing that's interesting, I mean, Maine can continue to bond, which it may do, uh, but also if we were to establish a, a clean energy and climate resilience bank, expanding the concept of a green bank that's been utilized in other states, most notably in Connecticut, and having that bank leverage private capital to undertake an expansion of our renewable energy projects, our energy efficiency projects, uh, and also allow it to even deal with adaptation. There are going to be a lot of projects on, on improving our waterfront, uh, dealing with flood controls and stormwater controls. A lot of jobs will be generated in the coming years as we adapt and prepare for climate change, which we all recognize now. And this, this bank is an idea. Other opportunities for funding, of course, the federal government's going to have to step up in a big way. And Maine raising more revenue or having more revenue will allow the federal government to allow us to get more match because many of the federal dollars are tied to a state or local government match. So again, that's something. Also, there are lawsuits that are afoot to, to, to require polluters uh, to pay more, like the tobacco settlement years ago or the recent Volkswagen settlement that could bring more money into Maine. Uh, so these are the kinds of things, and I know that, that many in Maine are looking at financing, being creative about financing. We want multi-state, we want even national uh, conceivably mechanisms to help fund. And no state, quite frankly, is going to meet what science requires in the coming years without the federal government stepping up in a big, big way. And there are carbon pricing. The economists will tell you that a better carbon pricing initiative than say TCI or Reggie is needed. And we need that at the national level. Uh, so. So these are the kinds of things I think the council will be taking a look at and certainly that Maine and other states are looking at going forward. Awesome, thanks David. And um, I wanna keep this discussion going. Um, a couple reminders, helpful reminders from some folks listening in to be careful of our use of acronyms. Uh, this is something that uh, it's very helpful to have a check on, I appreciate that. And uh, You're we had a question. About that. <laughs> I, I feel like it's the so environmental hard. community is one of the worst offenders. So please, please, please call us out when we slip. Yeah. It's so hard. And, and there was a question, actually, Dave, if you could do it in a sentence or two um, to uh, explain what TCI stood for and, and was. It's the Transportation Climate Initiative. It's a, it's a multi-state uh, Northeast regional initiative, again, that would establish a cap and invest program, put a tightening cap on emissions tied to motor vehicle sales in the region that would tighten over time that would thereby reduce emissions and also would allow would would require the the purchase of allowances that would raise revenue for all of these wonderful transportation solutions that the climate council is is taking a look at and has already surfaced and it's it's excellent work put together by the working groups right and and just one more piece about the transportation climate initiative because it it does it feels like a, a lot to wrap your head around. Um, the most important thing to know about it is that it's based on the same model that we have used very successfully to reduce emissions from power plants. So from the, electric, the electric generating sector, uh, that's what's called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative or REGI. And it, it's been incredibly powerful 
over the last decade or so, uh, a group of the, the Northeast states coming together to say, we cannot let our power plants continue to pollute and, and wreck our air quality. We're gonna tighten up the cap, make them pay to emit, to pollute essentially, and, um, and then use the revenue. And here in Maine, the, the revenue from that regional greenhouse gas initiative program is largely funding efficiency Maine. So you can sort of see that, that model of uh, taking a polluting sector, cleaning it up, and at the same time generating money to keep cleaning it, reduce the need for it. Uh, we need less electricity as we get more efficient in the way we use it. We will need less uh, gasoline as we switch to electric vehicles. And so it's a win-win. Great. Um, back on this question again of, uh, you know, what are the impacts of some of these policies under consideration to Mainers? Do Kathleen and Ani, do you have other things to add there? Sure, I'll just add something on the topic of land conservation. Um, at the moment, we're losing about 10,000 acres a year to development. So there's a lot of work to be done to um, have more land conservation initiatives. And um, there's a need to support hundreds of natural resource jobs, protect thousands of acres of Maine's forest. Um, Maine's forests um, are a huge carbon sink within the state. So they're really important to protect. Um, and then there's also a need to support ecologically significant land um, and address conservation uh, investment shortfalls. And one way to do this is creating a dedicated sustained public funding source that generates at least $15 million a year annu or annually to conserve working forest, agricultural and ecologically significant lands. Um, and in, if any of the other panelists wanna comment on that too, I welcome it. I'll just say if you have taken a walk in the woods or along the ocean in this, uh, this crazy time that we've been living in, you know just how much uh, we, need the, uh, we need to conserve our lands so that we have them available, not just for their environmental and, and climate benefits, but for our sort of mental health and emotional health and who we are. And, and one thing, a couple of things I would add as well is we're talking about sustainable agriculture and forestry as well. Regenerative agriculture uh, is something that we can do a lot more of in Maine and be good for the environment. And obviously it's good for food system and food security in state, as well as when we look at the forest products industry. I mean, Maine's always made a tremendous amount of money from forestry. It can make more by sequestering, and particularly if we develop any regional or national markets for carbon sequestration, which I think will come in future as well as if we manage the forest properly, we can expand the carbon stocking of a forest, the ability to, for the forest to take in the forest soils to take in more carbon, but also we can generate more jobs by, by also including embodied carbon in mass timber and also wood, wood fiber products, wood fiber insulation. And even if we get to the point where we've got advanced biofuels for some of the waste wood that is truly renewable. Um, and a lot of jobs, a lot of, again, more money for the state uh, in, in future. Great, thanks everyone here. Um, I wanna jump now, as I previewed in the chat a little bit to um, what happens next, right? So um, if we could, um, you know, what's gonna happen now moving forward? Um, and then, you know, really importantly, how do we, the council, the, you know, people of Maine who care about this, how do we get public buy-in and support? Uh, for some of these things as we move to legislation or, or other uh, pieces. Um, Kathleen, I wonder if you could start. Yeah, it's a great question. And this is where we put a big asterisk next to our, our title for today's program, the halftime show. Uh, it's like the halftime show of game one of <laughs> a very long series. <laughs> what we have in front of us right now is a framework. And the, the Climate Council has sort of 24 big ideas that came out of all of those recommendations that the working groups presented. It's a great start. There are a lot of really good ideas on the table. Uh, but the next step, the next immediate step, is to turn those big ideas into concrete actions and to really pull them together into an ambitious climate action plan 
that meets our statutory emissions re reduction requirements, that addresses our equity concerns, that really plans ahead and, and starts to grapple with some of the questions of, of how we're going to fund this. Uh, the, the cost of doing nothing different analysis demonstrates that we're going to pay for this one way or the other. Uh, we can pay for, for climate change in a really reactive sort of crisis management kind of way, or we can be thoughtful and proactive and say, let's make wise decisions about how we invest. Uh, that's, the, that's the immediate next step. Just that one, easy to check off, right? Uh, but even once we get that, that climate action plan in front of us, and it is due to the legislature on December 1st, uh, we'll need, first the legislature will need to accept the plan, and then we expect some, some legislative proposals to flow from there. There may be lawmakers who see um, an element of the plan and say, we're gonna we're gonna propose this piece of legislation to put that into place immediately. Those kinds of proposals will be grappled with in the, the relevant committees in the legislature. And it's really important for all of us to, to show up to, to support that process, to uh, build build a bipartisan, really broad sort of momentum to, to act on the climate action plan. Um, Plans are great when we carry them out. And David, I think you have some more specifics about, you know, what does it look like to carry out this plan? Sure, let me, let me touch on that a little bit more in terms of implementation, because it really is about who's assigned to carry out the actions that, that Kathleen has just talked about. And it's really state agencies, but state agencies working with the private sector and stakeholders. And that's why it's important at some stage that these actions, particularly the key programs, the agencies develop work plans that can be measured, that can be tracked, that can be routinely reported on. And of course, the science and technical work group will continue to take a look at all of this. I think, you know, you're going to need on, ongoing cost-benefit analysis. Um, and you're certainly going to need, um, you know, the, the council uh, in its work to continue to look at the progress. So that's why if if the state does establish work plans, agency work plans related to uh, not every action, but certainly the key actions, and that they measure them routinely, report on them, report to the council, allow the council to weigh in in its quarterly meetings, and, and certainly report to the legislature and the public. I think that'll help to drive, not only will it help us to measure progress, it'll help us to drive progress as it relates to all these important programs and policies. And as well as the goals and make adjustments as we need to going forward. Thanks, David. Um, so I'm watching the clock. Now, now we know why the Climate Council took six hours over two days <laughs> to get through this. Uh, we um, we want to move on. We have a lot of great questions we see coming up already. So we're going to try to move quick here. I'm going to end with one final question to each of the panelists. And then we're going to talk about very quickly some action items and then move into the questions. So. Um, that final question is, uh, you know, there's a lot of excitement in the air around this plan. Um, I want to know uh, from you, uh, what are you most excited about for this plan and the process so far, and why should Mainers be excited about it? Um, who wants to start? I'll start. <laughs> Go for it, Anya. <laughs> Clearly, there's a lot of reasons why we're all excited. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think this is just a huge, huge opportunity for the state um, to really be a leader and to really get some concrete work done. Um, again, Kathleen was mentioning that um, we have a plan, but then we need to get it done. And um, I'm excited for the work moving forward to really implement some of these great policies and also to continue adding some policies to the to the current plan. Um, as mentioned, the plan as it is now is a framework, so there's still time to add um, more to it. And there's definitely some holes that I see and that I've heard about within the plan that um, feel really important to get uh, within the plan. So I feel excited about that. Uh, I'm really excited about the, the opportunity that we have to meet a whole lot of our state's goals. Uh, the climate 
urgency that we all feel is clearly top of mind and, and what's driving this process. But at the same time, we have the ability to, to make our state a more equitable place and a more inclusive place to, uh, to build out our, the economy of the future to be really proactive in, in developing the kind of strong communities that, that we care about and that we really want to see. Uh, sometimes talking about the climate crisis can, can be overwhelming and frankly a bummer, but this plan is really exciting because of all of the, the things it lets us do and grapple with together. And Nick, I would just add, I'm, I'm just excited. Well, I'm very excited about being back in Maine where so many people are engaged in climate action. Uh, compared to Maryland, unfortunately, Maryland is, is not making the level of progress. So it's exciting that we've got a governor who's really committed to making a big difference as well as, as many in the legislature and local officials. But the fact that over 250 people have participated in the climate action plan planning process through the council and working groups is just tremendous. And that's very exciting. The other thing is I think Maine is well on the way to not only being a leader, but to being a carbon negative state. I mean, I think what you'll do, Anya Fetcher talked about more aggressive goals. I think quite frankly, we won't be only carbon neutral by 2045. Maine could be carbon negative. It can be a drawdown state. To really address climate change, we're gonna to have to draw carbon from the atmosphere. It's already there and we're gonna to have to draw it down and Maine can be a real leader. And I think we will, particularly if we just keep putting the, you know, pressing forward and, and, and as we, we have thus far, at least the last couple of years. Yeah, that's the kind of excitement I'm talking about. I love it. <laughs> Let's end right there with these questions. Thank you so much to the panelists here for uh, all your insight, that was great. Um, I want to move quickly now because we have a lot of questions to get to. Um, I want to, before we get to them, I want to talk about a few action items. Anya, if you could please um, share the slide. Um, just the first things you, you, a few things you can do if you're as fired up as we are. Um, the first is you can submit comments to the Climate Council until September 24th. That is coming right up. Um, we will, um, let's put the links here right in the chat. Um, my computer's not working, but um, they are accepting comments on uh, the work of the working groups and the work of the council until September 24th. So please go ahead and um, add your comments uh, if you'd like. Um, secondly, next slide is um, there are more meetings coming up. So as the council uh, further refines what the policies might be or what this plan looks like, um, they are hosting additional public meetings. Thank you uh, to them for doing that. Um, the next meetings are coming up in October, the 1st and the 21st. So that's the 1st from 9 to 12 and the 21st from 9 to 12 in the morning. Um, registration is, uh, is open, so feel free to do that. Finally, and uh, perhaps most importantly, vote. We need you folks to vote for a number of reasons. Um, the end result of this climate plan is uh, will likely include various pieces of legislation that will need to pass through the legislature. And in order for that to happen, we need to elect people who are going to help make it happen, um, whoever that might be. Um, so this page here from the Maine Conservation Alliance can help, uh, help, help you with everything you need to know about voting absentee um, this coming election. And, and we actually have a, a poll uh, for folks that can help you um, to ask whether you are planning to vote absentee and also um, some other actions that you could take. So we'd love to hear from you if you're planning on taking any of these actions that it could include writing a letter to the editor, uh, submitting your comments through the Climate Council portal, registering for the, for the meetings. Um, and also we have, a, we have another poll about voting absentee coming up. We would love to hear from you. We really encourage uh, you to take action. We know that these comments get right to the Climate Council uh, and they want to hear from folks. So please do that. So as you are voting in these polls, um, I'm going to move now into your questions. Thank you um, for, for bearing with us. Um, we've, we've had a few questions about the, the public surveys and who they reached. Um, do we have any sense um, for, uh, from the, the panelists here about um, whether those surveys were able to reach across party lines, say, or what the, what the um, what, do we know anything about that? Do we feel confident at all about that? 
Um, I can say that the surveys did not take, you know, per personal information, um, party information or anything like that. Um, and so, you know, questions about uh, did we reach both sides of the aisle? You know, I know that the Climate Council itself is made up of uh, bipartisan members um, covering lots of different ground uh, in the state from lots of different angles. And so um, to the extent that those folks represent the views of a variety of Mainers, um, that's certainly a critical part of the council. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I would add that certainly um, the fact that uh, responses came from 74% of Maine zip codes is a good indicator that there were many different types of folks from all over the state that responded. Um, though certainly, I think um, I'm of the opinion that no amount of public comment will ever be enough. And um, I know that this has been a difficult time. We're in a pandemic. It's hard to get folks to respond online. Um, the surveys were also long and uh, I took a look at them and they certainly were an endeavor to uh, to fill out. So um, yeah, the surveys in short, I think are not perfect and they're definitely not a perfect representation of the, the, um, the types of opinions that are uh, from across the state, but I do think that they give us a really good indication of what um, policies are going to be favorable and what aren't. Um, and I don't know, David or Kathleen, if you have anything else to add to that question. But yeah, my thought is just that they're not perfect, but they're what we have current, given the um, given the current circumstances and also that the time for public comment isn't over yet, um, which is also exciting. And, and I think it's, that's all, that's right. It's also true that the kind of support that we need is more than just this summer while we're developing the plan, right? We're gonna need uh, broad support behind the implementation, which is gonna take place over years. So uh, it, no one should feel like the window has closed on your opportunity to get involved. We will need continuous involvement. Um, it's also worth noting that sometimes what we see in this kind of survey effort is a really concerted opposition effort to go in and say, not a good fit, not a good fit, not a good fit. Um, I don't want to jinx anything, but that's not what we saw. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, we're getting into the questions here. Uh, this is a good one, I think, for on your right. Um, is there a plan, this is from Nan in Rockland, is there a plan to engage educators, especially at the high school level, to combine science, economics, uh, health, policy, math, writing, critical thinking, et cetera, into curriculum um, to encourage young people to uh, learn about climate and climate planning? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in short, not yet, um, but that is a, a great idea and certainly something that has been discussed within um, folks talking about adding climate education to the uh, Climate Council plan. I think um, I would add that climate education wasn't a part of the original uh, framework and wasn't discussed in depth within the working groups. And so it's something that um, is now being added because it's very critical. Um, and so I think this is a good, um, a good section that folks can submit public comment on if you have ideas or um, things that would be helpful within, the, within, edu within education and education practices. Um, yeah, but I would add that one of the recommendations that is being looked at is providing more training for educators to be able to um, teach about climate education in schools. Great. Um, I do see that it's one. Uh, I have some confirmation from my panelists and we can continue on. So if you are able to join as an attendee, please do. We're going to keep going. Um, a question from Ken um, about sort of clarifications about the scope of some of the recommendations, uh, about whether there are uh, recommendations for sort of community level initiative, initiatives and policies or if it's just at the state level. Does someone want to speak to that, sort of how these may be implemented or the scope? I, I can I can take a stab at that. I mean, I mean clearly they should be taken at all levels. Uh, much of what we've talked about in terms of the plan, certainly, uh, it's a lot of it's about state action, state agency action. But much of that action is to 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 help out at the local level, or to to you know obviously result in impacts and and programs at the local level, whether that's technical assistance, planning assistance engineering assistance for adaptation, for instance, preparedness 
vulnerability assessments, those kinds of things where local governments don't have capacity, the state should, and partners, private partners could step in to help out. Uh, some of the larger initiatives obviously are economy-wide initiatives, and that happens in large part at the state level, whether it's through the PU, you know, the Public Utilities Commission uh, or, or other things. I don't know if, if Kathleen, Kathleen wants to, uh, to say a bit more here. Yeah, you know, I, I often said um, that one of the silver linings of the, the LePage years was that in the absence of really strong state leadership on climate, Maine communities stepped up and we saw uh, energy committees and sustainability committees and all sorts of activity at the local level, which meant that when, when we were ready to have strong state leadership, uh, there were a lot of towns with a lot of ideas, both about the resources that they needed and about the, the barriers that needed to, that, that we as a state needed to get out of their way. Uh, so in the community resilience working group, there was a lot of conversation about how can we streamline the process uh, permitting for renewable energy projects, for example. How can we make that easy for towns to, to undertake? Uh, if I know I want to start a new program in my town, where do I go for the resources? That shouldn't take me any time to figure out at all. So our, our job really as a state is to, as, as David said, do the things that only the state can do, provide the resources that towns need, and get out of their way. Great. Thank you. Um, a question here for David from Nancy um, about funding um, grid improvements. Um, do you think that uh, Climate Resiliency Bank, Clean Energy Bank money should go to monitoring the grid? It, it, well, it can, it can go to any number of things, if obviously if it's structured broadly. But one of the things it could do, certainly it could, it could support a monitoring system. Although again, it depends on the kind of capital and who might want to invest in that, for instance, because we're trying to leverage private capital as well. But the other thing is it could help to establish a public authority of some kind that starts to accrue more public interest assets in the energy system. For instance, ener more distributed energy generation uh, projects, microgrids, these kinds of things. So again, the bank, conceivably a bank would only be one mechanism but it could certainly help to, to support uh, the development of, of any number of, of systems like monitoring, but, but certainly beyond that. And that's why I think one of the things I'd say also about on the adaptation side, the resilience side, I mean, the amount of money we'll be spending uh, on our working waterfronts to retrofit those waste treatment plants, even road and bridge infrastructure. I mean, these are the kinds of things where an infrastructure component of the bank would really help to to generate a lot of a lot of capital conceivably uh, and and jobs I mean jobs jobs a lot of good high high quality construction jobs high paying construction jobs those kinds of things thanks um, a question from Kathleen different Kathleen um, about climate justice issues um, could someone talk about how so the question is, any specific focus on climate justice issues? Um, could someone touch on um, what's going on there? Sure, I can take that. Um, thanks for the question, Kathleen. Um, there is an equity analysis being done um, that will be coming out within the coming week or so that's going to look at um, how the uh, proposed working group strategies um, affect different people differently and affect equity. And so definitely that's a focus. It's in statute that we have to look at equity. Um, and so that's certainly a lever to promote climate justice solutions. Also personally, as a council member, it's something that I'm especially interested in and especially pushing for within the final draft strategies. Um, so yeah, I appreciate that question. Definitely something that is really important as we move forward in order to create um, yeah, a just and livable future for all people in Maine. So thanks. Agreed. Thanks, Anya. Um, question from Scott. Um, 
the food system, so role of agriculture in the climate crisis. The food system, he says, is often deemed responsible for one third of overall emissions. Uh, it's deeply threatened by heat, drought, et cetera. Um, do we foresee more attention on local regenerative agriculture as we move forward? Or are there other general questions about um, the food safety piece of this? I, I can, let me, let me just jump in there. I, I, the this, this short answer is absolutely. Um, and if you, look at, if you look at an area where we can really absorb a lot of carbon, it's healthy soils. I mean, soils, healthiest soils really are carbon rich soils. And regenerative ag is, is agriculture that really, you know, you, you get more pasture, you, you get more turnover, you get more cover crops, those kinds of things that help to, to really bring carbon into to the soil itself. And as, as buy local, as Mainers buy more local produce, that's certainly gonna be great for our agricultural sector. Over 90% of the food we eat comes in from out of state, a more reliable, sustainable, uh, agricultural system or food system is one where Mainers grow more food and grow food in ways where they quite frankly might get start to get credit from carbon sequestration as as a benefit uh, as well and um, so I, I don't I hope that uh, if, if others want to to add in here that'd be a great great thanks David um, I am gonna, I see three minutes left. I'm gonna think, I'm gonna shut it down, I think at 1.10, just so we can all uh, get some lunch or move on. Um, a question from Joe. Um, any reactions to how GoPIF has incorporated the natural and working lands strategies into our framework? Yeah, I'll take that. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, in short, definitely some more that needs to be added to the natural and working land strategy. Um, and David was just touching on a few of those things. Um, and I think uh, one of those things that needs to be added is creating a dedicated sustained public funding source that generates at least $15 million annually to conserve working forest ag and ecologically significant lands um, in order to work on some of those funding mechanisms that David has talked about. Um, and then I would also add too, just to kind of piggyback on what David was talking about with the last question, um, I think definitely a need to look into food security within the state. 90% um, of Maine's food comes from out of state and as, um, as the climate changes and um, where we get our, where we're able to get our food from changes and also looking at the carbon footprint of, of our food. Um, that is a big, a big piece that I think needs to get added to uh, the Climate Council recommendations. So yeah, thanks for that question. Great, thanks, Anya. So I see 109, so that leaves me just one minute to sort of wrap up here. Um, and I'm gonna sort of jump off a question that Medea just asked, which is in a similar vein to some other questions about ensuring bipartisanship, ensuring wide buy-in in Maine about this. Um, that's critical to this piece, uh, not just in forming the plan, but also in trying to pass the plan or pieces of the plan. Um, that's where, you know, we really need your help. Um, the organizations on this call are ones that try to, um, you know, use our voice as loudly as we can to um, get all Mainers aware of and participating in this process. But, um, you know, as attendees, um, this is where you can help uh, help out a lot. Uh, join our events, share your opinions on Facebook and social media and in the newspaper and on the street corner, uh, wherever you want. Um, it takes all of us to sort of help ensure that uh, everyone is aware of what's going on and how important it is and, and how exciting this is. Um, so um, that's where we'll turn to next uh, on our second half or second few innings or whatever the end of uh, the, the next part of this is going to look like. Um, so game thank two, you, as Kathleen said. Game two, sure. Um, I want to thank all the attendees on today for joining. Uh, I want to thank my panelists, Kathleen, David, Anya, and Anya. Uh, I want to thank um, NRCM, the Natural Resources Council of Maine, for hosting us today, uh, Todd. And um, thank you so much. Uh, if there, there are questions we didn't get to, I apologize. We we're just crushed on time. Um, you can send them to me. I'm going to dare to put my, um, my email in the chat here, uh, inland at maineaudubon.org.
org. Um, let me know what you think. Uh, we will get a recording up as soon as we can and share that with you. Um, thank you to everyone, and I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thanks, Nick. You've done a great job. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you, everyone. Bye.